Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. All right, so we threw this together pretty quick uh, last minute, but uh, our guest is out doing things in the wild, so we have to sort of be on their time, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we have had this individual on before, and really a great time to have him back on because of the documentary we're going to be talking about, as well as the organization that he is partnered with, Exposed Wildlife Conservancy. Uh, and we'll really be talking about diving into their documentary, Trapped in the Past, which Part one, parts one and two are already out. We're waiting for part three. I leave in March. He is John E. Marriott. John, again, great to talk to you. I love the cougar photo behind you right now. How's everything going? It's going great, John. Thanks for uh, having me on, and thanks for uh, squeezing this in at the last minute. No, it's great. I this this was such a when you guys put out the trailer for it, and really are bringing attention to something that is not only clearly impacting Canada and Alberta specifically. But obviously here in the United States and the West where there's still trapping and snaring and there's still so much of this, a terrible practice really that's going on and bringing light to it and bringing facts to the public is such a beautiful thing that you guys are doing. And uh, just give everybody just a, a, a quick overview just about Exposed Wildlife Conservancy because there's it's more than just trapped in the past. There's a lot of great work going on there. So just give everybody a background about Exposed, and then we'll get into the documentary. Yeah, so John, Exposed started off uh, back in 2015 as sort of a a TV-like idea. We started a YouTube channel and we started doing uh, episodes that we called Exposed with Johnny Marriott. And it was myself and co-founder Kim Odland, and we put together all these videos that were basically exposing wildlife conservation issues particularly focused on apex predators. And so in March 2018, uh, we formed the Exposed Wildlife Conservancy. And uh, it is a nonprofit. It's actually now just as of this week, a registered nonprofit in Canada. So that's a, a huge moment for us. But we exist specifically to provide a voice to apex predators. So you know, we do do habitat stuff. We do trapping. We do trophy hunting. We do all this kind of stuff. But it's all focused on uh, grizzly bears, wolves, cougars, or mountain lions, um, and then some of the sort of um, secondary apex or, or mesa predators, uh, you know, coyotes, wolverines, lynx, bobcat, things like that. But those are that's the focus. It's it's on these big charismatic predators that have been um, so persecuted throughout North America, particularly the Western U.S. and Canada. And we're just trying to flip the script on that a bit. And uh, and so Trapped in the Past is a project um, that was really born when I went to Northern Canada to the Yukon back in the late 1990s and first got exposed to trap lines um, and sort of started to get an idea of just how prevalent they are throughout Canada and, the, the, and, and really throughout all of the U.S., not just the Northwest, but, you know, there's people trapping raccoons and coyotes and all sorts of stuff in North Carolina and Virginia and all over the place. It's really everywhere in North America. And so that sort of exposure to it 25, 30 years ago has led to this point where um, through Exposed, uh, we have put together a three-part documentary series on trapping and really what it is is we took all the arguments that the trapping industry uses to support itself um so that trap trapping is an important part of the economy and for for rural economies in particular um that uh that trappers are important uh for wildlife management that it's an important wildlife management tool that trapping is integral to wildlife conservation um that trapping is part of our heritage, that it's you know, how the West was founded. Um, and, and then the final one is that trapping is humane and ethical and they're held to the highest humane standards. And basically we just debunk every single one of these arguments. And we bring in experts like Carter Niemeyer, who you guys just had on uh, recently, um, Dr. Gilbert Pruel, who's uh, one of the world's leading trapping experts. In fact, he, he headed up 
a Canadian research facility that tested traps um, and that produced papers and produced all this new technology that was never adopted by the trapping industry. I was just completely shoved aside and he got let go and moved on. And uh, uh, it's just, it's just never come to anything. And so we are still dealing with an industry that really is, you know, dealing with the same types of traps and the same ideology that they've been dealing with for 30 years, 50 years, 100 years. They're using statistics, economic statistics that are so outdated. They've got absolutely nothing that's current. And when we actually dug into the numbers, which you see in part two, which we call the economics of trapping past and present, where we look both at the history of the economics of trapping, trapping, but then also at, at what's going on currently. We found, for instance, in Canada, the total amount of furs sold last year at the one fur auction house that we still have open was $7.8 million. And if you think of that, that's an industry with 35,000 trappers across Canada, and they only brought in sales of $7.8 million. It's literally, it's not even a drop in the bucket. Um, you know, wildlife photography, which I am a professional wildlife photographer, puts more into the economy than trapping does. Um, you know, it's a, so there was some really some eye-opening stats that we put together. Um, and then part one, uh, we do a really interesting job. We look at snares in particular. It's called The Truth About Snares. And we've previously done a, a brief 10-minute documentary on snares on YouTube. Um, but this one really looked into oh, 25 minutes worth of stuff. Um, and really just showing how inhumane they are. I mean, there, there's been this testing facility I was talking about in Canada has been testing them for 30 years and they have yet to come up with a single snare that can actually kill efficiently according to what humane trapping standards are, which there's actually an international agreement that says a humane trap should render an animal unconscious, kill an animal in under three minutes. And snares have never been able to, to trappers have never been able to prove that they do that. And it's interesting. You go and you, you, you get trappers that are arguing, oh, you know, my snares, they kill everything quickly. I get that wolf and 20 seconds later, it's dead in the snare. And you go, okay, well, that, that's great. Let me, let me put a couple trail cams up on your snares. Radio silence instantly. I have put that forward to over 50 trappers now. Let me put trail cams up on your, on your snares. I don't have a single taker yet, still. So, I mean, that tells you all you need to know right there. Exactly. And I, I think what, what's great about what you're showing here, and, and you said, it's the outdated economic, it's the outdated statistics, it's the outdated information that is being told to folks out there that, like you said, this is economically viable. This is something that is part of heritage. And I believe you, you do, I think, in the first part, or even in the second part, touch upon native individuals who you who are also you know not necessarily in this conversation and it's it's used differently we just spoke with uh, an awesome person uh, an awesome tribal member up in Oregon Austin Smith jr doesn't I didn't don't believe he brought up trapping but also but the the ethics of hunting for the native tribes and what it means to them and it's completely separate from like you say laying out snare lines and trap lines all across these large swaths of land and then the bycatch is really the issue here that comes out of this, right? Is where we look and see, like you talked about earlier with the apex predators up in Canada, the bobcat, the lynx, you know, even raccoons, any, anything, wolverines, anything that can get caught. If you're looking to catch a cougar and you catch four or five other things other than the cougar you're looking for, it just trickles on down the line and it just impacts the ecosystem so much. What was the thing thus far or because well, the project's complete, uh, the documentary's complete. But as you were going through it, what was the thing that most surprised you that you just, you heard the information or you saw whatever it was and it, you were just completely taken aback by it? Uh, the economics. Once we, once we actually started delving in and breaking down how much an individual trapper grosses in a year. So I'm not going to say how much they make in a year because they generally don't make anything. Um, we, we actually found um, podcasts and, and older articles even before the recent drops in the fur market. So the fur market has just plummeted in the last 10 years. It's gone down 85% in, in pricing um, and in sales. And 
even before that, the statistics were showing that most trappers were making about a dollar an hour. Like this is, is it's not a part-time job even. This is literally a hobby. Um, and so one of the things that was, I guess another thing that was totally shocking to me, and I, but I already knew this, but I think it's shocking to a lot of people that view these first couple episodes, um, is how much power trappers have despite having absolutely no training in wildlife management, wildlife biology, ecology, um, anything. Um, I've got a bachelor's of science in wildlife management uh, from University of British Columbia and University of California, Berkeley. And I don't get any say in how wolves are managed. But a trapper can go take a three-day course, buy a fur management license, pay their $40 a year fee, which is what it costs here in Alberta, Canada, and they can go out and if they are able to, they can catch as many wolves as they want. There's no bag limit, no limits whatsoever on how many wolves they can catch. So we have trappers that in certain years have been you know, trapped 20, 30 wolves in one winter on their trap line. And that's considered to be totally okay. Like they're managing the ecosystem. And I did air quotes there because people aren't going to be able to hear that when I <laughs> say they're managing with air quotes the ecosystem. And these are people that don't have any qualifications whatsoever to be managing. So that kind of stuff, I think it's it's uh, it's a game changer for us to start getting this information out there. And this is why we made these documentaries. Maybe this won't be what turns the tide and changes things, but it's certainly going to educate a lot of people and get them thinking about this subject that is just, as part of the documentaries, it's, it's just kind of slid along, kind of shrouded in secrecy, for the last 50, 60, 70 years, you know, there was the big movement against fur in the 1970s and another one again fairly recently where a lot of the major companies dropped fur from their from their garments and, and, and coats and so on. But it's still, everything's really slid under the radar that everybody's still out there doing this as a hobby. You know, like I said, 35,000 trappers in Canada and more than that in the U.S. still active. Um, I don't know the U.S.'s numbers off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, you know, from from a from a wolf perspective, you know, both Canada and the U.S. did not sign on to the agreement in, on international humane trapping standards. The U.S. actually never did sign on. Um, Canada signed on, but only under the exclusion of snares. So both countries knew that it was impossible to prove that snares were humane. So they refused to sign on to this agreement. So we've got this humane trapping agreement. It's what trappers always point to and go, oh, you know, we're latest technology, blah, blah, blah. It's just total BS. Um, it, you know, the snares themselves haven't changed in 80 years. You know, it's still a loop of wire that slowly chokes an animal to death and cuts off its blood supply. Uh, still the same technology. Oh, yeah. The technology hasn't changed. You're right. I mean, what does it say about the... Again, we I, I think it always wires back to politics, to money, whatever it may be. But what does it say about the political system or, or the practices put in place, I guess, by the management agencies that countries are allowed to not sign on to these agreements? Obviously, I guess if they don't agree with it, which is partly I would assume why somebody would not sign on to something if they don't agree with it or understand, like if that's something that doesn't you know, go, go with them and and their values or whatever it is that they want to do. Why is this still allowed? Why is this something that's not looked at more at higher levels of bureaucracy? Or, or is it something where, like you said, for the last 80 some odd years, things like this have sort of slid under the radar and we just sort of let it go as status quo. Is there any kickback, pushback, or, or how did this even get into this situation where, most of the world, I would assume, or whatever, the, wherever this doctrine came about, most of the countries signed on if they're going to do hunting and trapping, but these two countries did not. Yeah, it, I mean, it it dates back to a little bit how you know both Canada and the U.S. were were founded originally and you know homesteaded uh, from east to west and and you know in particular out in the western parts of both country. Um, as the homesteaders came in and then, you know, it hit drought and, and hit when times were tough, they just started expanding out and doing things like commercial trapping. 
um, to make that extra buck and help support their family and put food on the table. So it really was an integral part of the economy through 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, you know, into the 19th century, into the start of the 20th century, even that's just faded away completely. You know, it's, it's, it's but, but we've still, we're still left with that romantic notion of, you know, you go off and you're living off the land, you're building a little cabin and you're snowshoeing about and none of that exists anymore. You know, now they're building fancy cabins and, and they got solar panels on the roof and they're using big trucks and ATVs and snowmobiles and, yeah, they, they and and they, you know these are doctors and dentists and lawyers and you know people working in the logging industry and oil and gas and so on and so on. they all have real jobs and they're just funding their hobbies. Um, so, from a political standpoint, it's just kind of you know been the way it's always been, and, and nobody's ever come forward and asked for change on a lot of these things, or it's or it's been kind of a quiet squeaky wheel. And we we intend to change that. We want to just start putting more and more pressure on. And, you know, part of what gives me hope, and I talk about this in part three, which comes out on March 6th, um, it's our the, the finale episode, and, and I say that um, California gives me hope because California has actually banned trapping, you know, just very recently completely banned it. Um, so the commercial fur trapping and, and fur sales is over in California, and that gives people like me hope knowing that okay there there are places that have done it in North America like there are there are models to follow um and here in Canada Prince Edward Island which is one of our small provinces way out east has actually just put forward to the legislature uh, a bill to ban trapping um, now whether it goes through or not it's another story but again it's it's these baby steps we're starting to see steps it's sort of like, you know, California was the first to ban mountain lion hunting. That was 30 years ago. And then, you know, Oregon came on, Washington State came on, and they, they both banned hound, hunt, banned hound hunting. Um, Colorado has recently taken a step in that direction. Utah has gone the opposite direction and gone just full bore. You know, we're going to kill every cougar we can find. Um, you know, from a trapping perspective, in, in places like British Columbia and Alberta, it's really a free-for-all. You know, if you go and look, it looks like it's a tightly regulated industry, but it's not. There's no enforcement. There's very um, lax uh, check times on traps, for instance. For instance, you can go out and set a snare in November and check it in March, and that's totally legal. So you could have a cougar strangling to death in there that slowly freezes, that then gets eaten by another animal, and the trapper, you know, if they're busy, just don't get back in time to and I've actually found animals partly eaten on trap lines before. I've also seen the, the, you know, the carnage that's strewn about afterwards. When they go in, they just skin these carcasses, throw them aside. Um, you know, they're not eating fox and coyote and wolf and stuff. They're just grabbing the furs. And even if the fur isn't good, sometimes they just leave the fur itself too. Um, so it's an astonishing waste of, of uh what I consider to be valuable predators in our ecosystems. And it's just the wrong people to be managing it. You know, there, there is a, I, I can, I can see an argument where there's a place for trapping as a management tool for, for instance, uh, helping with uh, a beaver issue on a, you know, a, a ranch or a municipality um, where they're damming an area and you need to be a trapper to come in and live catch the beaver and transport it somewhere else. But the days of needing a trapper to come in and kill something and then sell that fur for money, are they're gone, frankly. Like, they're just not that need anymore. You don't need to be going in. And, and a trapper is not selective enough. You know, even if you have livestock predation by, say, a wolf pack, trapping is not selective enough to figure out, okay, are they, can they get the whole pack? How do they get it? Do they get a whole bunch of other stuff in the meantime, all that bycatch? Um, it's just not an effective tool for that kind of thing. No, and I think what, the other thing that people sometimes don't don't see too, and, and you've brought it up, <clears throat> excuse me, and others, Carter Niemeyer, Casey York, other individuals who are in the trying to eliminate trapping to a degree, is that we're not just talking about predators on the ground too. We're talking about eagles and hawks and all other types of things. Like you say, if you snare whatever it is, a raccoon or something that maybe or a rabbit that they might eat, then, you know, the the bird of prey or the, the raptor gets caught. Yeah. And so the raptor's in there too. So this really is, 
like you said, it's not selective by any stretch of the imagination. I'm having a hard time grasping the romanticism part of it. And I wonder where does that stem from? Because I, I can get on board to a degree with, again, we're talking about 16, 17, 1800s, like you said, maybe beginning of 1900s, not for the mass ex, you know, extirpation of predators across the landscape, which happened over there. I'm not talking about that. I can understand where there was ways to make a living back then and people had to do what they had to do. But where, what is the romanticism part of this that people are clinging to today? Like you said just before, when tra- there are no li- limits or no check marks on when you have to go check the trap lines and you leave them for months at a time, to me, that's not romanticism. To me, that is just, like you say, a hobby. That is just, it's, it's wasteful and frankly, just indiscriminate killing of animals on the landscape that have no business, nobody has any business managing this way. So where does the romanticism come in for this? I just have a tough time wrapping my head around that. You probably do too. Yeah, um, well, a couple of points there from what you just said. Um, so one, you know, I should mention that most trappers don't leave their trap lines for like five months at a time, but it's really, right. really- No, of course, yeah, but in the extreme it's measure. It's really yeah. common for them to be just every weekend or every second or third weekend in fact, all the trap lines that I've monitored um, in the last 10 years have been checked irregularly. Um, now, the romanticization of trapping comes a lot from how we homesteaded the West and then the books and the, the, the movies that have come out of this. So you think of a movie like Legend of the Fall. Um, so the trapping, the homesteading, the going out and conquering the land, that's romanticized in a movie like Legends of the Fall. Um, a movie like Jeremiah Johnson, when I grew up, um, was a big popular movie in the 1970s with Robert Redford. And same thing, it's a man going out, living off the land, conquering nature. It's all these struggles and challenges, but it's not like that anymore. Like we're not conquering new lands and we're not, you know, there's this whole new mindset now that we're not dominant over nature, like we're a part of nature. Um, And that's more of the First Nation indigenous way of thinking, the native way of thinking is that you know, we've always been a part of nature and that we we exist, you know, there are brothers and sisters out there, these different animals. And it's not as dominant, like we are at the top of the food chain and we kill everything below us and it's our deer and our elk. And we're going to kill every wolf and cougar in sight because they're ours to eat for us to eat. That's just not a realistic way of thinking in my mind. It's not a, a correct way of thinking, I don't think. I don't believe in that. That's not my belief system. So, um, you know, these old movies, there's books out there. I remember reading a book as a kid called Crusoe of Lonesome Lake, which was a Robinson Crusoe-like tale of a, a guy who went into British Columbia in Canada about 500 miles north of Vancouver and just homesteaded there back in the 1920s. And part of his homesteading was trapping the land. And that's, he'd, you know, once a year, trek out to the closest town 100 miles away and get supplies and sell all his furs and stuff. So that, you know, there's some sort of romanticism to that, but that's not what happens anymore. Nowadays, it's just, you know, Joe Smith is a logger, works five days a week, and on Saturdays, he drives out on these logging roads and checks his trap line that he's got set up all the way along the roads for 40 miles and takes a bunch of coyotes and he gets 20 bucks of fur for them at the fur auction and makes a thousand bucks and thinks, hey, cool, this just paid for part of my hobby you know, paid for a few tanks of gas. It's it's ludicrous that we allow it to keep going on. Yeah, I don't understand how it's, how, like I said, how it's allowed to to still happen. I mean, where, where when you get in those conversations too, because you talk about, you said something interesting too about ungulates on the landscape, right? When we talk, you know, there are individuals, and I'm not just saying hunters only, but people who are worried about elk herds, deer herds, caribou herds, whatever, whatever the herd may be that we're talking about, depending upon, again, your state, your country, whatever it may be. And that the ungulates really are the attraction to the individual who's there. Like you said, it feels as though a lot of the homesteading that happened, there's this ingrained notion for some that these prey animals are specifically ours and that we need to make sure these specific herds are healthy and basically forget the rest. 
when you come upon those conversations, what's the tact to show maybe the opposite um, argument and say, these herds are actually quite healthy. And then if we don't have something on the landscape to manage it naturally, we could wind up with things that are, are going to be worse off for us like CWD yeah. and, you know, other diseases like that. Yeah, there's a couple different lines of thought there. One, I don't necessarily always engage with um, people like that. Uh, you know, I just, I just had a, a post about wolf trapping on my Facebook page that I ended up blocking almost 2000, you know, the, the whole big anti-wolf crew came in and, you know, started putting SSS, you know, the shoot, shovel, shut up stuff and and posting all kinds of pictures and so on. And I was block, 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 took me about 20 minutes, but block, you know, a couple thousand people in a hurry. And so there's, there's no point arguing with people like that, but, the people that I do like to convince are that are the in-betweens, you know, or people that aren't necessarily aware. You know, that's partly why we're making this trapping series, because a lot of people just aren't aware it's going on. But um, you know, there's a couple of arguments. Number one, there's a lot of science, um, a lot of papers out there. You know, it's just brand new one out of Washington State about the effects of uh it just just in the last week of the effects of wolf, wolf reintroduction on elk uh in Washington State and Interestingly enough, you know, surprise, surprise, elk have actually continued to grow in, in number in Washington state, despite having wolves reintroduced and repopulating and doing quite well. Um, and 80% of the female mortality was human cost. Um, so, you know, that's how you monitor an elk population. You know, if, they, if female elk are surviving, then things are going well. So, uh, you know, even with all that human caused elk mortality, it's still growing. Um, so despite the wolves, despite all the human cause mortality still growing, um, you know, as Carter would have probably said in his, you know, right now, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, you know, a lot of these states have the highest elk numbers they've had since wolves were reintroduced. Um, so again, not much of an argument from a science perspective that, you know, there, it just makes no sense. You, you know, you look at, I, I live right beside a national park, Banff National Park. Would it make sense for wolves there? to just kill everything on the landscape because then they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't be able to have pops. They'd have nothing to eat. So it just makes absolutely no sense when people say stuff like that um, from a biological pers perspective. Um, so ecologically, you know, of course there's a balance there. And of course it gets tipped a little bit here and there, but it very quickly rebalances itself. Um, you know, I, I drive into Banff and Jasper very regularly, I go down to Yellowstone, there are tons of ungulates on the landscape, like tons, you know, there, there's bison and elk. And just because one might be going down, like elk might be going down right now, bison might be going up. I mean, they still cull bison outside of Yellowstone. Like, obviously, they're doing fairly well in the park and in, in the area if, if they have to cull them outside of the park. Um, you know, the yeah, there's plenty of ungulates. All you have to do is drive to, through Yellowstone and you'll see bighorn sheep and deer and elk and moose and and bison and you're like what are these people talking about like there's tons of wolves here too yeah it's just it's interest yeah like you said it's it's trying to to rationalize i think again the romanticism that has been ingrained in some folks for quite some time and like you said the extremes are never going to want to come into the middle part of it and maybe sort of tip away there or have a more balanced approach to what's going on. What is the ultimate, I, I mean, I, I always ask something like this whenever you see a documentary or what was the ultimate goal when you were all putting this together for three parts? Did you guys have, you know, a certain, a certain group you were looking to hit was like you said, is it obviously it's bringing attention to information. Where were you guys when you were when you started this idea, and now that it's come to fruition, like you said, we have one more, one more uh, part to come. Where where is where do you want it to do? What do you want it to do, and what do you want it to ultimately accomplish once the three parts are fully out and everyone can see the whole thing? Yeah, so a couple different things, you know, from a from a just strictly metrics kind of view, we were looking at we we wanted to get a hundred thousand eyeballs on it. We're at about 30,000 so far. So we've got a ways to go, but we've, I mean, the, the literally just, you know, part two just came out on Saturday. Um, so like 
five days ago from when I'm chatting to you, or six days ago. Um, so it's still fresh out there. So the fact we're at 30,000 views already between Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, is fantastic. We, we'd set this sort of initial goal, get to 100,000 views, a bigger goal, we, we've got across Canada, we have a, a form email letter system that's going out and we've got a couple thousand of those already um, filled out where people have taken action. We wanna drive that action. We would love to get up into the tens of thousands in that um, and, and put pressure on Canadian government to, to start to, to look at changing things. Um, but from a, from a broader perspective, um, so besides raising educational awareness, there's two keys we want to get out of this. Number one, we want to get snares banned um, nationwide in Canada, nationwide in the US. Um, and we feel this is the initial stepping stone to just getting the word out there, putting these building blocks in place that now groups, conservation organizations, whatever can come to this and go look at these videos. This is, here's this. Here's all these arguments we've actually put together on our website, which is uh, exposedwildlifeconservancy.org. Um, we've put together this huge database of trapping related um, knowledge questions. So you can go in there and you, you can look at this knowledge base and you can go, oh, what's the economic value of trapping? And you go in there and you can read all about what we've got in there so far and we keep adding to it. I was actually just working on more stuff this morning to keep adding and keep filling it in. And as we get more questions or as we get more trappers poking holes in it, we go, OK, we're going to plug that hole. Here's the truth. Here's the information. Here's the data. Here's the study. Here's the link. Um, so th that banning snares. And then the other one is we want to reform and trapping regulations. So we're not naive enough to think that we can make trapping go away altogether, at least not at this point, um, not necessarily is that something that we are striving for either at this point? But we do want total trapping reform. So we want snare banned. We want check times up. We want bag limits introduced for a lot of species throughout all the states and provinces that don't have that kind of legislation in place right now. Um, we just want much stricter rules around trapping so that it discourages a lot of these hobby trappers and gets much more serious than the ones that you know, trappers are serious about this and, you know, maybe there are, is, we can find a place for them here and there where they're not so much killing, but more they're live capturing things and stuff like that. More of a wildlife management tool for relocation and stuff like and that. Conservation, so right. trappers can still stay involved, but they're not just doing the killing for this senseless 20 bucks a fur, 50 bucks a fur type of stuff that just makes no sense economically or, or environmentally. Yeah. I mean, what's, when people watch this too, and listen, I implore anybody who's listening to this, and if you haven't checked it out already, please check it out. Part one and part two are fantastic. I can't wait for part three. Because this is, mo this is I, it's all about Alberta, correct, John? I don't think it's, uh, it, did it, does it dive into, I don't think it dives into the US, right? This is strictly uh, the province of Alberta up in Canada that trapped in the past? Yeah, okay. so the focus the focus is on the province of Alberta. Okay. And I should mention, by the way, um, all of this stuff, the videos, um, all the information is at trappedinthepast.com. Yes. Um, so trappedinthepast.com. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the focus of the docuseries is on Alberta, Canada. Um, but we do branch out throughout, um, particularly part one and part three. Um, and we've got actually quite a bit of US influence in it because Carter Niemeyer is one of our main interviewees. And he's of course a, a, a wolf trapping, reintroduction, predator control specialist. You know, He's got all this amazing background from the US um, with US Wildlife Services um, and with uh, wolf reintroductions. And then um, int being introduced in part three and playing a major role in it is Dr. Adrian Trevis, who is um, from the Carnivore Coexistence Lab out in Wisconsin. And uh, he's, you know, what would be considered one of the world's leading carnivore experts and, and you know, large carnivore biologists, particularly for um, Canadian and American large carnivores. And so, you know, we brought in some heavy hitters and they're both American, which we felt was fantastic because there is this sort of focus on Alberta as a, you know, it's the easiest one because we're here to dig up all the regulations on and use it as the base example. But really this, the, the, the purpose of the documentary is to be as global as possible so that groups and individuals from anywhere can come in and go, 
like we're we're actually in our knowledge database right now. We've got volunteers that are putting together all of the U.S. data of bag limits for different species, what the trapping seasons are, what the different regulations are in each state. Um, so that's all going to be added to it in the next month or two. Um, we want to end, eventually end up having this email form letter um, also have a U.S. component to it um, where people can just go punch in their uh, their zip and, and immediately it gets sent off to their state representatives or to wildlife officials. Um, so it's all part of the, the master plan, you know, how, how far along we get, I guess, depends on how much people continue to support us. But, you know, this entire documentary was put together on donations and, and volunteer work. I, I myself volunteer everything that I do for my conservancy. I don't get paid a cent by them. Um, so, you know, a lot of it's very near and dear to a lot of our hearts. Um, so um, I think people will feel that passion, both, you know, listening to my interview right now, but also when they watch the videos. And and I think it gets, you know, from, from the feedback so far, people get fired up, um, whether they're in Canada or the US, we've been getting a lot of American feedback already. Um, and and people are pretty pissed that this is still going on and it's kind of slid under the radar, like, like I said earlier. I love that you're compiling all of the data from everywhere. I think that is, that's such a crucial point and the email list is fantastic. And like, and the fact that you guys are now that exposed, like you said, just, you know, it became a 501c3. That's, that's phenomenal. So anybody who's listening to who is, pa is passionate about this or has seen it or is, you know, fired up about the work that Exposed is doing, you know, donate, help them, support them so they can continue to do these things all the time. John, for you, what's the best way that people obviously go to trapped in the past, uh, .org, dot org or dot com dot com that one's dot trapped, com in, trapped in the past exposed, dot com. exposed wildlife conservancy is dot org. dot org okay and we'll have those links in the description obviously but for people who are looking at this and sh seeing that this stuff is happening in Canada what would you say to the people who are maybe outside of and we get a lot of Canadian listeners here so anybody who's obviously in those provinces or in that in Canada can obviously call the representatives and, and do that is it the same for people in the United States? Can they call up in Canada, call these representatives? What's the way that they can tackle these issues, not only here in the United States, but also if they're seeing that it's happening across the border, uh, up where you guys are? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a couple of different things. Um, putting pressure on, you know, the, Canada has just really, Alberta in particular, has just released a, a big plan to increase our tourism to $35 billion a year. Um, well, you know, where do you think a lot of that money comes from? It's from Americans coming up and visiting places like Banff and Jasper. And, and you know, I think the, the pressure, it would be great if people are phoning or emailing in to Alberta government officials, to particularly tourism departments, and saying, hey, we want to come up and wolf you there, but we can't find anything. Like, where, you know, is there anybody, is there any Indigenous groups? Is there any... You know, is there anything we can come up and do some wolf viewing or go look for links somewhere or, you know, because right now it's just all consumptive use. And, you know, we know from Yellowstone, for instance, that Yellowstone's wolf viewing economy, they've, you know, they've studied it and it's worth $35 million a year, which is, I will quickly remind everyone, is about four times the amount of the entire Canadian fur industry made in fur sales last year. <laughs> Just, just Yellowstone wolf viewing, not any other kind of animal viewing or anything else or anywhere else. Um, so it's putting that pressure on officials, you know, saying, hey, I'm not sure I want to come up there and spend my money up there unless you guys are, uh, you know, why, why are you still killing things? But I think from a U.S. perspective, probably also the best thing to do is start putting pressure locally. Um, you know, the more politicians hear about this kind of stuff, the more elected wildlife officials hear about it, then the more it's just in the back of their mind and it just slowly can start to turn the tide. You know, California didn't come about just flick of the wrist or anything, you know, it was a, it was a long drawn out process that took decades and decades. And, uh, and so it, it, it may be a long fight. It probably will be. Um, but, you know, even if we can get little baby steps along the way, you know, make, trap line signage mandatory throughout Canada and the U.S. So people know there's a trap line, so their dogs aren't getting caught in traps. Um, you know, little tiny things like that, they can just be baby steps that start getting officials thinking about these things. 
And, uh, and then eventually we're going to get a ban on snares and we're going to, you know, thir- I should mention 13 states have already banned snares. So it's not like it's, you know, it's just in Canada that it hasn't happened. But, you know, there's 13 states already in the U.S. that have. So you, you're already partway there. And I, I love what you're saying. And this, this is all the thing. It's people got to be active and everybody has to be, go to the right places, find the right information. So for Trapped in the Past, uh, parts one and two are out. What's the best place? They can obviously go to trappedinthepast.com, but uh, go to uh, Exposed YouTube page. Is that where it's uh, flying? Yeah, so it's under the YouTube Exposed channel. Uh, so it's Exposed Wildlife Conservancy, Conservancy, if you just Google that and or YouTube that. And uh, and trappedinthepast.com has the videos right there embedded from YouTube. So you can just go watch right there and do all the, the reading right there as well. Oh, I love it. Yeah, all the information in one place. And listen, anybody who's who's listening to this conversation, go to exposedwildlifeconservancy.org, go to trappedinthepast.com. Check out, obviously, John E. Marriott's f- photography if you haven't. I mean, if, if, you're, if not, you've been living under a rock. <laughs> he has such wonderful photos uh, of all walks of life. Uh, so John, listen, thank you for getting on, getting on with me here and really sharing a little bit more in depth about the project, about the docu-series. You're doing fantastic work. Thank everybody over there at Exposed, uh, from us here at the podcast. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what's one thing you want to leave with everybody who's listening, uh, when they, when they hear this, uh, and they want to go watch Trapped? Well, uh, go watch it and then take action afterwards. Do do something. Doesn't doesn't you know? Even it can literally be as small as make a comment on the YouTube page or share it on your Facebook or do you know some little thing that just helps us out with the algorithms, gets the word out there even more. You know, if you can donate twenty five bucks, donate twenty five bucks. It's still better than 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 doing nothing. Um, so anything little like that. And I just like to thank you, John, for giving me the time to uh, to speak out again. I appreciate it. Absolutely. You're always welcome here. And obviously any any other docu-series, any documentaries you guys have coming up, you have a free, uh, just let us know. Email us. Uh, Johnny Marriott, thank you so much. Thank everybody at Exposed. Uh, fantastic docu-series. And like John said, the third part's coming out March 6th. So catch up for part one and two and, and get ready for part three. Uh, John, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Thanks, John. Absolutely. How's to you all out there? And we'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? Please visit our website at wolfconnection.org where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer.